That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. Now, what I've done in the last couple of streams like this is that I've turned them into audio podcasts. I was always apprehensive of doing that simply because I do a lot of visuals. However, the feedback I get is a lot of you can't sit and watch a YouTube video, and I totally understand that. And even though there's a lack of visuals, you prefer the podcasts. So I've been doing that in the last couple, and it seems like it's been going very, very well based on the feedback. So I'm going to do that again with this one. I'm prefacing the episode because some of you watching the video may be wondering why I read a little bit more or explain what you're looking at even though you might be looking at it. It's simply for the audio version. So thank you for the patience on that. But I wanna make sure that everybody has access to this information. Now, what I am doing today is profiling some records that came through the Freedom of Information Act from a very trusted um, uh, website that I am aware of. I don't profile a lot of of FOIA releases that others get simply because I always want to make sure the material is real. However, this particular site I am very, very well aware of and uh, trust 120% everything is legitimate. Uh, And I have verified the FOIA cases, etc. And again, prefacing the story in the video with that simply because I want to give them uh, absolutely the credit where it's due for getting these particular documents. Now we are talking about some internal NASA files specifically for, um, let me see here, some emails from the Associate Administrator of Communications for NASA. His name is Mark Edkind. Now, I have filed uh, quite a few NASA requests uh, based on emails. Now, I've done some videos on this channel. You've seen some written articles about me. And interestingly, I never did a request on Mark Edkind's uh, um, email address. And so this was kind of a surprise when I saw it posted and I thought I would profile it here simply because there were some gems inside. Uh, A quick footnote on the case that I filed, it was actually cases, there were about 12 of them, and it included not only Bill Nelson, the administrator, but quite a few other NASA uh, personnel. Uh, Again, not Edkind, but quite a few others. NASA had made me aggregate the request, which means they wanted me to take all of the 12, put it into one. Why I was apprehensive of doing that is it takes a lot longer. A lot of agencies want to do that where they put everything into one case. Um, I'm only giving you guys that extra tidbit of information because a lot of you ask me FOIA questions and you will run into that sometimes where let's say you do very similar requests, but you file, you know, five, 10, whatever different ones. Sometimes they will aggregate them and it's very frustrating. It also takes a lot longer in my opinion. So that case is still pending. I'm eager to see what uh, comes up. But in this particular release with Edkind, again, there are a couple gems that I think you guys will really like. So here's a little bit of uh, biographical information about Mark. Again, he's the Associate Administrator for Communications for NASA. Uh, He joined uh, January of this year, so relatively new to the agency. And essentially, uh, I'll read this uh, background from him. Previously, Edkind served as General Manager for the Science Channel part of Discovery Inc., a position he began in 2015. In that capacity, he was responsible for all aspects of development, production, brand strategy, and day-to-day operations for the network. So that's a little bit about his background before he uh, joined NASA itself. Uh, So this was a search uh, by a site by the name of governmentaddict.org. If you're not aware of it, I would highly recommend checking it out if you're into government documents. There's a lot there. Uh, Very rare you'll find UFO information, which is what we're talking about today, but you'll find a ton of government material, historical uh, material, stuff of, of high value in my book. Again, a very trusted source, and I don't say that often. So if you're not aware of the site, definitely go there. They post stuff on a weekly basis, uh, and it's um, uh, definitely a resource you should have in your digital Rolodex. So all credit to them for this particular FOIA release. They posted these documents through the weekend, uh, and uh, and that is where you can download them. If you're wanting the direct link, you will find it below in the description here on YouTube and also on your podcast platform. You will find that uh, as well where you can download everything. 
One quick note before I get going, uh, if you haven't seen videos like this when I profile documents, I don't aim for the video to cover 100% of the entire release. Number one, the video would be 17 hours long. Uh, but number two, I'd probably bore you to death going over every little nitty bitty uh, gritty de detail. However, what I hope that these videos do is inspire you guys to download the documents, wherever they may be. Uh, I always try and link them in the descriptions. Download them and take a look. You'll see the documents or the portions that I verify and and uh, and go over and, and uh, overview on this channel. Uh, but on top of that, you can see a lot more and, and you'll be very, very surprised at some of the other gems that you'll find because sometimes I'll miss something, I'll overlook it, uh, and and uh, it's always good to have uh, other sets of eyes on these types of records. Also, it may give you ideas. I know a lot of FOIA researchers watch this this channel, and uh, and I'll be going over something later to kind of show you guys a little bit of what to, to look for in FOIA requests. Uh, but that said, you know, it gives you ideas. The raw data uh, that lacks editorial, you know, the the you don't take my word for it. Look at it. You always get some good ideas from that. So I always encourage everybody to, to do that. So let's dig into some of the, the highlights of this particular release. This one is actually just more for fun. And you uh, all out there that like the ancient alien, advanced ancient civilization theories and stuff like that may, may find this interesting. This was a private citizen. The name was redacted. Uh, for those internet sleuths out there, you could probably find out uh, who this particular person is, but I'm not going to say their identity. Uh, but they have posted these pictures publicly. And uh, in addition to doing so, they also wrote NASA and the Smithsonian Institute uh, emails with the subject line UFO, UAP, alien earthenware pot, symbols, cloak drawings, ancient pot type, unique, and the Pentagon's UFO report. That's a heck of a subject written by this private citizen. Uh, the reason why this particular uh, document or email came out in this request, and I haven't said this yet, is Government Attic filed the request for a keyword search, which is a very common tactic. It's it's the case that I filed that was aggregated that I mentioned. Very, very similar. You request a search of a person's email box with certain keywords. Uh, give them a date range, say I want documents or emails from you know the year 2020 or 2021 or whatever your time frame is, and that's your FOIA request. That is how these documents came up because the request was for, you guessed it, UAP as one of the keywords. So that subject line, which pretty much encompasses the whole gamut of UFO related keywords, uh, he wrote in, uh, which included not only at kind, which is why this came up, but you'll see quite a few other names here that you might recognize, uh, all within NASA or most within NASA. And essentially, he was trying to find help this private citizens trying to find help for something that uh, that he has in his possession. I'll show you photos in a minute. This was the original in June 2021 email he wrote to the Smithsonian Institute also looking for help, which I guess forwarded them to forwarded him to NASA, according to him, if you read all the emails. Uh, but he says, Dear Smithsonian, I own this fascinating UFO UAP alien cooking pot and posted the following request for info three years ago on Collectors Weekly. I've now been referred to you. Can you please help? Your aerospace people may be able to help, along with anthropology, linguistical, and carbon experts, etc. Attached is more information, excluding infrared thermal rotating video. Is it alien communication or just amazingly multidimensional? Uh, yes, without further anticipation here, this is the pot that this guy sent into the Smithsonian and then later to NASA and uh, to quite a few people at NASA. And you can see for those watching the video, I believe this is what he's referring to, are these multiple objects which appear to be flying in the sky, saucer shaped, uh, kind of on an axis there. Uh, that's how he believes that this is an alien cooking pot, I guess. So kind of a fun little find, uh, not really a artifact that I've seen before and all the talked about uh, talks about ancient alien theory and and ancient artwork that depicts UFOs and there's some fun ones actually out there uh, but that being said this was uh, another photo here's how big it was not even a foot high 
and you can see that uh, UFO looking object there. So take a look at that for those watching the video, any language experts out there, if you can deduce anything from it. The guy actually posted, I didn't know this. Uh, I run a message forum on the Black Vault. Here's another cool find in this FOIA release. Um, I had no idea that this particular person posted it on the Black Vault. And within the email communications, you'll see the Black Vault mentioned right there, right into uh, right in this FOIA release. That was kind of a fun, surprising find, especially since it wasn't my FOIA case. And yet uh, this particular person had posted the photographs on my website as well in a public message forum. Again, I had no idea. I don't monitor 100% of of what people post. So that came as a surprise to me as I'm going through. I was like, what's my site doing in here? Uh, and there you go. So there was a lot of talk internally about that alien pot, whatever it might be. Moving on from the fun find, let's get a little bit more serious. Um, this was a two, or excuse me, about a three or four page paper that was written by astrophysicist David Spurgle. It, it looks like uh, it was not distributed publicly at quick glance, although some of you uh, internet sleuths out there, again, may be able to find this somewhere. I, at quick glance, I did not see it. So I believe that this was an internal or at least something that was uh, distributed a little bit more privately uh, by this astrophysicist on his thoughts on UFOs. Now, it's not every day that you see somebody of his credentials talking about UFOs and mentioning aliens, which I'll get into in a, in a minute. Um, his quick CV, and I can't go over it in, in, in its entirety, it's very impressive, but he's the president of what's called the Simons Foundation. He's the co-chair of the Widefield Infrared Survey Telescopes a Science Team. Uh, he's a Charles Young Professor of Astronomy uh, Emeritus on the Class of 1897 Foundation at Princeton University, and it goes on and on. His background is incredible. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to to um, uh, to, to David Spurgle, seeing maybe if he might be interested in coming on this channel and talking about this paper, since it's now public uh, and out in the open through the, the, the Freedom of Information Act. And I'll, I'll read a little bit uh, about it. Again, it's, it's quite a few pages long, so I'm not going to read everything. Uh, but again, the title, Thoughts on UFOs, written by David Spurgle, distributed internally by NASA. Uh, he talks about what are they, meaning what are UFOs? And he says, quote, the most conservative hypothesis is that these UFOs are built by humans, experimental vehicles under development by the U.S. military or by foreign militaries. In the past, famous UFO sites, e.g. Area 51, have turned out to be test sites for advanced technologies. Some of the triangular-shaped objects that are capable of rapid accelerations and high speeds do seem remarkably similar to descriptions of hypersonic vehicles that are currently under development by the Army, Navy, Air Force, DARPA, and the NSA. The Indian, Chinese, and Russian military are all developing their own hypersonic vehicles. DARPA HTV-2 had test flights over a decade ago, so that the recent appearance of flying triangular-shaped objects that can reach high speeds seems consistent with this hypothe hypothesis. There is also extensive work on developing drone swarms by many nations, including even Armenia, whose properties match some UFO reports. He then goes into uh, another explanation, which is natural phenomena. He talks about ball lightning, or what he calls St. Elmo fire. Uh, moving ahead on the paper, this is where he talks about the most interesting, and this is actually how he terms it, the most exciting hypothesis is that some of the UFOs are extraterrestrials visiting the Earth and studying the planet in its life forms. Aliens capable of interstellar space travel are not likely to be using technologies that are familiar to us, e.g. solar sails or hypersonic air-breathing vehicles. They would only be detectable if they wished to be seen. For example, they would likely want to miniaturize their probes and not likely to have familiar-looking vehicles. Given astronomical timescales, alien life is likely either a billion years less advanced than human life or a billion years more advanced technologically. As Clark's third law states, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguish indistinguishable from magic. So he talks about the alien hypothesis. Again, not something that you see every day 
in connection to UAPs or UFOs from astrophysicists, astronomers, astrobiologists. Generally, they stick with life way out there, not down here. So for them to uh, start talking about that uh, in these types of internal papers, very encouraging. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting for me to see. Again, I won't read everything to you, but in his paper, he also talks about the observables and uh, essentially asking the questions where, you know, where they come from, what, are the, what, what is their duration, the amplitude, uh, the acceleration, the velocities, how frequently are the events, so on and so forth. And he talks about that scientific approach on how to look at the UAP issue and try and solve it. So a very interesting paper. I would, I would uh, for those interested, download it and read it in its entirety. Moving on to another one, this is where the FOIA researchers out there, I'm going to throw this out to you that uh, it's just kind of a fun example of what you look for when you get a FOIA release. A lot of people wonder, how do I start? You know, how do I get into it? Well, I told you how this request started. What would be the next step? And the next step is you go through the documents you get very much like I'm doing now, but you look for the FOIA leads, what can be a FOIA lead. Some stuff is just interesting and there's, it's not really a lead per se, uh, but it, it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Other things you can go after, for example, this email sent June 8th, 2021. You can see here at 1224 PM, it was from Randy Cruz. He was the senior advisor to the administrator or Bill Nelson for NASA. He was writing Mark Edkind, who we've been talking about, that was the root of the FOIA request, and Bob Jacobs, uh, also NASA uh, um, uh, personnel. Gents, I tried to send the short brief to you on JWIX. Uh, on a quick side note, JWIX is the top secret level communication method used internally at the government so they can share highly sensitive material. Back to the quote. I tried to send you the short brief to you on JWIX. However, neither of you have an email address on the classified side. I have verified that, and then it's redacted, likely some names and some identifying information. You just don't have email addresses. When, you, when your schedule allows, I can bring you two into the skiff on the sixth floor and go over the brief with you. Let me know your availability and I'll have it set up. Today would be great if you can squeeze it in. Shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. Randy Cruz. Going back to the FOIA leads, that's all interesting, right? I mean, it's a cool little story that obviously Randy Cruz, he had a classified um, something, uh, a brief of some kind, maybe a PowerPoint presentation, maybe a document, uh, who knows what it might be. But he had something that he was trying to send on a high classified uh, method to two other NASA individuals who weren't, weren't uh, able technologically to receive it. So instead, Randy Cruz says, hey, we'll take you up to a secure room. We can do it that way. What's the lead? And if you're reading all the lines, the lead now, this, this shows you that there is a brief, it's classified, and it, it, it exists. Now, some of that sounds silly. Why do I say it that way? Because this document now serves as evidence to use in a FOIA request to say, I want this briefing material, all of it. You can create a mandatory declassification review request, but let's not get too, too, too complicated here. Stick with FOIA if you're still um, you know, somewhat new. Uh, just file a FOIA request for it, and you can actually cite this particular document and say, on June 8th, 2021, then Senior Advisor to the Administrator, Randy Cruz, mentioned a briefing, document briefing material that he was trying to send to two other NASA uh, personnel. Uh, my request is for all of it. And that's your lead. And that evidence now can be submitted. And if NASA comes back and says, hey, well, we have no records and they slough you off, you can use that in an appeal. And so that's where stuff like that is very important, where you can easily gloss over this and go, okay, it's an email, they're sharing some information, that's cool. That's your branch. That's your branch to another FOIA request to go after because it solidifies that something exists 
that you did not get in this particular release, or at least it doesn't look like that particular release had it. So you go after it. And so you'll hear me talk a lot about a tree branch, that that's how I view this. You know, your release is your, your trunk, and then it just branches off into all these other requests. That's how that happens. So little side note for the FOIA people out there, for all others that may have been boring to you, uh, but at least you see how and why you want to look out for stuff like that. So again, this was June of 2021. Uh, I had written a story about a uh, two stories, actually, that I'll show you about briefings on UAPs as connected to NASA. And one of which was right after the UAP task force was formally announced in August of 2020. They, meaning the UAP task force, reached out to NASA and requested that they brief NASA on UAPs and UFOs. Including in that briefing was the director of the International Space Station or the program manager for the ISS. So that's pretty fascinating in my book that the UAP task force went out of their way to contact NASA and say, we need to brief you guys on UFOs and UAPs. And in that was the program director for the space station. In addition, one of the other people from NASA that was at the briefing or, or was asked to be at the briefing uh, worked for Bigelow Aerospace and Bass. So I found that as a very interesting connection, Bass being the uh, subsidiary of Bigelow Aerospace that won the OSAP contract that we always hear about with the UFOs and UAPs and now all sorts of other aspects of the paranormal at Skinwalker Ranch. Regardless, he was at the briefing as well. So kind of an interesting connection. But that was uh, uh, about September of 2020. So this briefing material that I'm that I'm talking about in this new FOIA release, totally different than that, including a second story that I wrote that showed that Bill Nelson was briefed on August 17th, 2021. And I was able to get the Pentagon to admit to that, that the briefing took place. They would not place Administrator Nelson there. Uh, that's kind of expected. They generally don't talk about the physical uh, pre uh, spokespeople don't talk about the physical presence of a certain someone, especially the administrator in most cases. Uh, and that is true with this one. But regardless, the FOIA revealed that it was a briefing for, Na uh, for NASA's administrator, Bill Nelson himself. So couple them together, it confirmed my story. I had published before the Pentagon statement came in, they take their pretty time. So I gave them ample uh, time to respond. They didn't. I published, poof. I had a, a new statement shortly thereafter, so I edited the story, but it essentially put it uh, irrefutable that it was confirmed that Bill Nelson was briefed in August. Point being, this also was a little bit different than uh, timing-wise than the other briefing. So a lot of people talking about briefs and briefing material internally at NASA. So it's very interesting to see as more information comes out how involved NASA is in keeping abreast of the UAP and UFO information that they're keeping on top of it. They're, they're seeing the classified material and it's not just the administrator. Uh, it looks like it's probably from the top down. I won't go over all the documents like I mentioned, but you'll also pick up other names that likely were briefed or saw the classified version of the report. Obviously, Nelson has talked about it, uh, and we all know that, but you'll see other scientists as well that, that uh, had seen it. Another document uh, in this release were the talking points to the UAP phenomena as it connects to NASA in relation to the release of the UAP report. You'll notice a lot of this stuff is all around the June 2021 timeframe, again, when the UAP report was published by the U.S. government. NASA was internally talking heavily about UAPs at this time for that reason. And you'll see in a couple minutes a PowerPoint presentation that NASA wanted to utilize that news essentially for their own benefit. And that's a, a pretty interesting slide deck, which I'll get to. But before we do, the talking points I'm going to read to you, especially for the audio podcast listeners, on what NASA was essentially prepared to say about the UAP issue. The documents will show many other talking points to related scientific um, efforts, 
including space exploration, the search for alien life out there. I'm just going to read to you the UAP specific ones. One of NASA's key goals is the search for life in the universe. Although we have yet to find signs of extraterrestrial life, NASA is exploring the solar system and beyond to help us answer fundamental questions, including whether we are alone in the universe. From studying water on Mars, probing promising oceans worlds such as Titan and Europa, to looking for biosignatures in the atmosphere of planets outside our solar system, NASA's science missions are working together with a goal to find unmistakable signs of life beyond Earth. To date, NASA has yet to find any credible evidence of extraterrestrial life, but we are not closed to the possibility that such life exists, and then there's a redacted portion of that line under B5. It's uh, cited as exemption B5. Uh, Really quickly on a side note, B5 is essentially internal deliberation. It's stuff that they're talking about internally that may not be finalized. Drafts, for example, that are not final reports are generally exempted under B5 because they're still drafting the report. So they're essentially deliberating on the inside what to say in the final report. So that's an example of of what's redacted uh, under B5. So I was super intrigued by this line put a pin in it because I'm about to solve the mystery for you. Uh, You just have to pay attention closely to the FOIA release, uh, but put a pin in that. So um, again, we are not close to the possibility that such life exists. Again, the rest of the line is redacted. Back to the quote, we stand ready to support the rest of the government in the search for life in the universe, be it close to home on the planets or moons of our solar system or deeper in space. The nature of science is to better understand the unknown. When we learn of unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, or more commonly known as unidentified flying objects or UFOs, it opens up the door to new science questions to explore. Most UAP sightings result in very limited data, usually video recordings from a single angle that can only be cross-validated with eyewitness testimony. The language of scientists is data, but without access to an extensive set of data, it is nearly impossible to verify or explain any observation. The lack of robust data, including the lack of access to some existing data, is the central problem for scientific study of UAPs. In in a sense, the discovery of technology from beyond Earth or the signatures of technology on other worlds would constitute the ultimate biosignature. And that was written by Karen C. Fox, Senior Science Communications Officer, in the Office of Communications for NASA headquarters. So those were the talking points. Now, talking points, uh, I've done some some videos on that as well, mainly on the Pentagon side. A recent FOIA release, I think it was last month of the recording of this, uh, released a bunch of what they called briefing cards on not only UAPs, but the UAP task force and and the Navy UFO videos and a couple other uh, a couple other things. And so I'd filed a request for those and was surprised that they had so many briefing cards. So if you're curious about how that agency has their their press statements as well and, and their bullet points, make sure you check out that video. But obviously NASA had their structure of how they wanted to respond when the UAP report was out as well. Now remember that redacted part, that B5. Again, to date, NASA has yet to find any credible evidence of extraterrestrial life but we are not close to the possibility that such life exists and then it was redacted. Well, you will see in this document here, which was an internal document, whether it was a mistake or not, they didn't redact it in this one. There were like three or four other instances where they did. Why? I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure, but here's the line. To date, NASA has yet to find any credible evidence of extraterrestrial life, but we are not close to the possibility that such life exists and might have visited Earth. To me, that's not internal deliberations and is a bad redaction. I think they wanted to hide the fact that NASA is not ruling out that alien life could have or is visiting planet Earth. To me, That's fascinating. To me, that they needed to redact it was fascinating. 
If they didn't redact it, I don't think I'd find it as interesting, although it's still pretty cool. But the fact that they wanted it redacted in the other uh, mentions of it in this FOIA release uh, is kind of a, a mystery to me. I, I don't know why they would do it. The only possible explanation that I can come up with is they had it slightly worded differently in the other versions, but I don't see a, a kind of a difference and the, the line seemed to fit. Um, so maybe they had some other different versions and they considered that a draft and they fine tuned it to this. I'm not sure. Uh, that's a, a, albeit small possibility, but one nonetheless. In my opinion, this was a mistake. Uh, they wanted it redacted for whatever reason. And on this one, they messed up that on the June 4th, 2021, uh, what they title Search for Life, it's Techno Signatures and Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, UAP slash Unidentified Flying Objects, UFOs, that document, they overlooked it. So kind of a fun find. You should always read every word. Uh, and that's why. So I won't go over all of the key points again, but it's uh, pretty much identical. There's some other background information. This was actually, if you pay attention to NASA's website, was morphed into a, a web page that they have on NASA talking about UAPs and essentially showing their side of the issue. But these documents show more of their side. And that's why I always love FOIA versus what the government willingly gives you because you get gems like this. And obviously, sometimes mistakes happen. In here are some questions and answers. Um, this is likely possible questions that they were going to be asked with answers that they were prepared to give. Uh, I am very surprised there are this many B5 redactions on that. Um, I don't feel or see that this is a draft document, so I don't see why they would be redacted. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, even though this wasn't my FOIA release, what I am doing is going after this particular document and requiring a review of the B5. I believe I'll probably be initially denied uh, simply because they've reviewed it in the last two years. But what then I'm going to do is file the appeal and say by the publicly available record, uh, the B-5 exemptions seemed excessive. Uh, B-5 is also known, nicknamed by people like me, as the redacted if you want to exemption. And essentially, even though it's it's internal deliberation and there are things that fit into that category, it's one that's easily gotten away with. If the agency just doesn't want to give the information out, they go, oh, sorry, internal deliberation, B-5, and it's the redacted if you want to uh, citation. So in, in my opinion, I'm going to go after this because here's another page of the same document. You can see almost all top to bottom, all redacted B5. For me, since this is public information, or at least how they were going to deal with the public, this is something that is excessive in my book. If it's approved to say it's not sensitive or exempted, but maybe no press people ask the questions, and so they don't want to give away NASA's prepared answers that they were ready to give. Again, excessive use of B5. One of the last things I want to go over with you is the slide deck that I had mentioned before. In one of the emails, it says, in one of the attachments, uh, which, which was the slide deck, it says, a slide deck with thoughts on how best to amplify NASA's role with the search for extraterrestrial life in the context of the upcoming report on UAPs. Uh, again, this was a, a slide deck, a PowerPoint presentation attached to one of the emails. I take it like, how can NASA benefit from the exposure that UAPs are getting? And how can NASA inject itself in that? That was kind of how I was, I, that's what I gathered from this, was, was how could they best benefit from that, that coverage and how could NASA get involved? Because obviously they, they kind of weren't. It was all about the military and DOD and ODNI and the Navy and so on. So I think NASA internally was looking to see how they could benefit. Um, Almost screwed up there. Uh, so the the, co the cover uh, UAP planning, and then you can see underneath here another B five exemption. Um, I don't know what that would be. Uh, maybe a tagline of some kind. 
Generally under PowerPoint presentation headers, you see a personnel name and that's exemption B6. So the fact that this was B5 kind of was a little confusing, but obviously they didn't want to show me or show us as the general population. Short term, catching the wave on the UAP report. All that information blacked out, but the title catching the wave on the UAP report, not. So again, they're trying to benefit from the avalanche of, of coverage that was likely going to come from the UAP report. Media, again, half of it or so, B5 exempted, all redacted. You'll see some names in there that you did see in front of the cameras, including Bill Nelson, Thomas Zerbukin, I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, those uh, actually did a, a press conference together, and they both spoke. I've done uh, FOIA requests and already received final responses uh, quite a few months ago on uh, Thomas's uh, email box. And some very interesting gems came out, including the revelation about the Nelson briefing, et cetera. I have multiple cases on Bill Nelson pending. Uh, some documents have come in. So again, definitely use the search engine on the blackvault.com. I'll also put some links down there in the descriptions. So that way you guys can see some of those NASA documents that have um, come out. Ravi Koparapu, uh, that's another one that uh, I've had pending cases on for quite some time. Some of the other names, uh, again, not recognizable, but those are FOIA leads. You go after that. Why are these people in there? Well, they obviously have something to do with UAPs or talking about it. So you branch off, even though a lot of these people I had already hit with FOIAs before, the new names, you file new requests. So the FOIA people out there, this is where you start picking up your next leads on where to go. More redactions here. Um, here's uh, just a, a link to some some information about um, uh, study to search universe for signs of technological civilizations uh, on a site called astrobiology.com. A search for techno signatures around newly discovered exoplanets. Jean-Luc Margot at UCLA, solid science communicator. So I think that they were talking about people that they could put up in front of the cameras. So these redactions in my book were probably mislabeled, but I, I could be wrong. It's kind of hard to tell. How they were going to hit social media, Tumblr, current and upcoming NASA missions looking for life. So they were going to, again, just kind of ride that wave, as they said. A Reddit AMA or Twitter spaces with uh, SMEs or subject matter experts answering questions. Uh, print media, set up a FAQ on NASA search for life that we can point to whenever needed via social for media, etc. Feature evergreen content on current and upcoming NASA missions looking for life. So they were really aiming to get a lot of exposure from this. Cleaning house, need to update this page, a top page where you search NASA UFO, and then it gives the NASA address for UFO sighting question and answers. Uh, that is a working URL, so you can type that into your web address. I won't say the whole long thing because there's a lot of characters in it, but for those watching the visual, just type that in and you'll be able to see NASA's page on UFOs. Here's a fun slide, um, entirely redacted. So we have no idea what that one is talking about. Next slide, long-term, continuing the conversation. So they wanted to not only ride the wave, but keep it going. How they were gonna do that, entirely redacted. Next slide, potential larger activities. Uh, this was kind of interesting. Workshop slash NASA social, some redactions there. It was uh, a workshop between scientists slash, slash astronauts slash rocket engineers and science fiction writers. Again, a bunch of redactions. Social humans of NASA vignettes. Hoping, and then again, I'm, it's kind of hard to read this. There's a lot of redactions, but just some of the text. Hoping to lean into those redacted, but would depend on what we get. <laughs> which is always intriguing when you see that. Uh, a video series, maybe planning a video series, uh, a series of four to five videos or recorded shows. Again, lots of redactions there. So some of those redactions, again, those, those are probably legitimate examples of B5, where a series of four to five videos or recorded shows, they could have then just bounced a few ideas out there and they would consider that internal deliberation. Uh, again, accurately fitting into B5. So um, I, I know that some of those side notes get probably a little tedious and boring, but for the portion of the audience that watches these about FOIA and stuff, I always just like to add those so you can kind of see the struggle between trying to figure out what's legitimate, what's not, what's appealable, 
and what's not and what you can go after. So that's the end of the slide deck. Uh, that was that was the end. There was one blank slide I didn't show you guys, but um, no redactions. It was just a blank. I think it was a mistake. Other than that, that, that was the slide deck on that. The FOIA release itself is quite large. Uh, so there, there's a lot to read and there's a lot that I didn't go over. I wanted to at least show you the highlights. And as I said earlier in the show, I wouldn't go over everything because it would be a 16 hour video. I'm already about 40 minutes in and barely scratched the surface. But I hope this is an encouragement, um, um, an encouragement, I guess, uh, to go out there and look at more, see what's there, see what's available, see what you can go after and see those leads. And for those who watch this that are uh, using the FOIA, hopefully those side notes work for you that you can see what you look for in addition to great information, but what you can look for for your next request and start branching out and digging and digging and digging because that is what this is all about. That and of course, it's a team effort, which is why I always like to, again, give credit where it's due. www.governmentaddict.com uh, is the website, and you can uh, go on there and download all sorts of stuff. Uh, very, very, um, very, very in-depth. There's a ton of information on there. And, and forgive me, I misspoke. It's www.governmentaddict.org. So .org, not .com, but .org. Lots of information, very in-depth website. You'll be able to download all sorts of information, including this particular FOIA release. Uh, I did clear it with them uh, of um, uh, talking about their FOIA release. And of course, the team over there was very gracious and said absolutely. Um, but I wanted to make sure I gave credit to them. So that said, Thank you so much for listening. I'm always interested in your comments, so make sure you post them below. If you're listening to the audio version, those five-star reviews really, really help. That's what I aim for, uh, but honest reviews nonetheless. So if I didn't hit the five-star, let me know why, uh, but those, those reviews are very much appreciated. If you are watching the video, thank you for doing so, but please, if you can, take two seconds, if that push the thumbs up button, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and hit the bell. That way you are notified when I go live. You're going to see a lot of new content here through the end of the year and 2022, I have a gut feeling is going to be a heck of a year. So I'm looking forward to all of that. But again, always interested in your feedback, put your comments below. And the biggest help of all, is if you can help spread the word about the channel. If you found this interesting, feel free to share it with others. That said, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we will see you next time.